Thanks for checking out Eating Crow. Like and subscribe so you never miss a video. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another thrilling episode of the Eating Crow podcast. I'm joined by Sonny Linebarger. Sonny, nice to meet you. Yes. What's well, the second Fun time we've week. met, actually, I guess, right? Right. Technically. Yes. So, um, you know, I, I do a lot of these. You have one of the most professional backdrops I've seen in a home office studio. Thank you. <laughs> it's intentional, too, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. Are you an avid reader? I am a... Uh, this, this is just what I can fit on this shelf and have a pretty background. I have another bookshelf here, another bookshelf downstairs, a bookshelf in, in our room. My husband thinks I have a little problem, but I don't, I don't see a problem. <laughs> What's your favorite <laughs> genre? Uh, leadership, self-improvement, uh, you know, mindset, growth, 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 whatever... Uh, whatever avenue you can take it. What's the most impactful leadership book you've ever read? Ooh, Tribe of Mentors. Tim Ferriss Ooh. is excellent. It's like eleven inches thick, but it uh, it really just goes through you know an, uh, hundreds of people and their experiences, and uh, and so that's it's kind of a cheater book, right? Because you get a ton of experiences inside of one book. Um, geez, that's a really great question. God, probably at least two books a month, if not more than that, if I really get into one. Wow. Um, one that I just am in the process of, I'm on the last chapter now, is Compete, uh, Compete Every Day, Jake Thompson. Yes. Excellent book. Um, yes. So yeah, I, I eat up all that I can. I think you, did you do a post on Compete Every Day? I did, yeah. Yeah, I commented. That's the first time I commented on one of your posts. That, that, that struck me. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah, he's a great guy doing doing some really good work out there. So, uh, by the way, big fan of Tim Ferriss. Uh, there's a guy on the edge pushing everyone to that's right. push their bodies, their minds, their souls in a, in a completely new direction. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting. You're an avid reader. You're a leader. You're a, a spokesperson. And most people would not consider that to be the traits or characteristics of someone who's the chief operating officer at a hospice company. Yeah, I think you're probably exactly right, which is what takes some folks by surprise. I think that's an it advantage. Does. It does. <laughs> what's completely, and I'm, my guess is if you're applying leadership principles and sound business principles in an industry, people would not consider to be a growth or competitive industry, you're winning. Yeah, that's right. That's right. A good example of that is um, we have a quarterly strategy meeting where we bring all of our senior leadership in. We all get around the table face-to-face -face and talk about uh, reflecting on the past quarter and, and forecasting for the next quarter. And, and what I do, which is probably not very typical of a business meeting either, is it's usually started off with some super robust, loud sports video on motivation. And so this one, I actually had my meeting earlier this week, and this one was talking about motivation, and then I ended it with the All Blacks Haka dance. This warrior yes. dance, that, New Zealand All Blacks, and I had it connected to Bluetooth and the speakers, and and I'm like, watch out, guys, we're about to blow the windows out of this room here. <laughs> but I think that that um, woven in to your principles, your leadership principles, uh, that does something different. You know, on your LinkedIn profile, the backdrop picture is a quote from Nick Saban, which again is interesting. A big, solid sports metaphor on your backdrop. I love the fact that you're inspiring your team with motivational content because, and we talked about this in our prep call, your approach to the hospice, hospice industry is different, right? It is. People don't understand a, the need for it, how it's paid for and how it's not, um, it's not a taboo topic, right? It's Many not. families need it. And you're, you're ultimately helping people. So why don't you, and you, you've got a long background in hospice, why don't you tell us the three things about the hospice industry that get you out of bed every morning that motivate you? Yeah. Uh, gosh, I think the number one thing uh, in hospice is if you are not patient-driven and patient-focused, you are in the absolute wrong line of business. Do everybody mm -hmm. a favor and get out of that line of business, right? Um, our goal every single day, and most of the people in hospice have been impacted personally, and that's mm -hmm. usually what led them into hospice, and we refer to what we call a hospice heart. And that hospice heart is really caring for somebody and feeling like it's an honor to walk somebody through the last days or weeks or months of their life. That's a gift. And, and it's almost selfish because though we get to create this incredible relationship from a frontline perspective with patients and their families, 
it's it's almost equally, if not more rewarding to that person providing the care. And so wow. that's, I think, the number one thing that drives everything we do every single day. And we're not, uh, at Bristol, we're not the typical, you know, hospice business uh, model, if you will. Most every single person on our executive team, we don't lead from an ivory tower. We all have mm. been frontline caregivers. Most of us started out our careers as CNAs, which is, you know, if you're looking at it from a professional perspective, it's kind of that very first rung on the ladder. And when mm -hmm. you can go about business and guide people in a way where you have been there and done that, I think that changes how people understand. You know, it gives us a really unique perspective and lens to run the business. So that's first and foremost. <clears throat> Second of all is um, I, the messaging out there. You have to... Almost, you know, we're over 30 years into the hospice benefit being a, a Medicare. It was enacted with Medicare to be this benefit that people are entitled to. They work their entire mm -hmm. lives and they're entitled to this benefit. And, and the sad part is, as far as we are in this 30 plus years, some people still don't have a good understanding as hospice. There are some people who only get, you know, they find out and they, they seek curative care over and over and over. And then by the time they come on hospice, they get three days of hospice care. And that's mm. just, that's a shame. It's a shame because they deserve the care, they deserve the education, they deserve to be walked through that process with a full circle of support around them. So I'd say the messaging and really getting that out there, getting the appropriate messaging and casting out any of those, um, you know, that, that it's a taboo topic. Mm -hmm. And then I think third of all is, if we're providing, if we're doing the good messaging and we're providing this incredible care, we have got to hire the very best people to be able to ensure that care is provided. Mm. And so hiring and driving and growing and guiding your team, um, that's really what gets me up. Those three things really get me up and going every single day to love what I do. Yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that for sure because I think that's a big part of the people listening to this program. You mentioned something about the messaging where is it because people that are eligible for hospice find out too late that the service is available to them that they only get three days of care, or is it a legal logistical thing? What would be the reason they would only get three days? There's a variety of reasons, but yeah, I think there's still some some physicians who aren't they aren't on board with the hospice philosophy, and wow. so they would rather uh, try to make sure that they're treating people. Maybe they, you know, again philosophically they just don't support it, and so they may be trying to get somebody treated curatively until their very last days. You know, when you look at cancer patients who are with stage four, late stage three cancer where they're continuing to get treatments and the prognosis is not good. The thing is, right. is that hospice isn't the piece just where you give up and you go quit and you get a bunch of morphine and you die. I mean, that's truly what some people, that's their view of it. And that's makes, that breaks my heart. Sure. Um, and so I think it's, there's a lot of physicians out there that don't push it, which is unfortunate. And so we try to do a lot of partnering in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think there are some folks who may have had a bad experience. And so if you've had one bad experience, everybody around you knows that message reverberates, right? And so your friends and your family, they all get a little bit of a skewed lens of a, maybe a bad experience. Sure. Um, and so there's, there's a number of reasons. And I think still today, uh, there's just a lot of fear around it. Yeah. I mean, people have to remember in any industry, in any discipline, there's a bell curve, right? There are people who excel on the far, far right side of the bell curve when you, when right. in anything, right? You could, you could get a cup of coffee in the morning and you meet the world's greatest barista. You're thinking, I would want to, I'd want to do that job, right? They just look like they're having so much fun versus, you know, something as, as important and personal as this to have a bad experience does resonate. And, it uh, does. but it's, it's, it's still people interacting with people and there's still a business behind it that has to sustain it. So exactly. all sorts of opportunities for failure, all sorts of opportunities for success. Right. So, so let's shift into the, to the last thing you mentioned, which is hiring the best people, training them, enabling them, retaining them, and, and kind of building up that culture and that team. What have you found in your evolution into the, to the, operate, the chief operating role to be the most important attributes of the people you have in your team? Uh, compassion. Okay. You know, hands down compassion. And it, it's, it's amazing to see sometimes how people make their way into healthcare and they, they're, yeah. they're a little bit shy on that amount of compassion mm -hmm. that they should have. And when you're experiencing firsthand uh, 
navigating, helping someone navigate down this road where their life is going to end, where they're, that, this is the closing of their chapter, you have got to have somebody who will do whatever they need to do to make sure that you feel supported emotionally, psychologically, physically, that you feel safe, that you feel like you have dignity. And I think the number one characteristic in that is going to be compassion. Sure. And behind compassion, how would, what would be something else you'd be looking for? And I guess let's stay on compassion for a minute. Sure. How can you tell it in an interview process? It's such a soft skill. What are you What are you doing to tease that out? Yeah, I think a lot of the behavioral questions and experiential questions okay. that you're that you're asking someone how they handle the situation with a really difficult set of you know family members or sure. a really difficult experience and how did they respond in that or how did they react in that? Sure. And I think you. Interviews, if we're being completely honest, are an absolute crapshoot, right? Yeah, they it's are. you're putting you're putting forward your best foot in an interview, and uh, and hopefully you're asking the right questions and you're vetting it accordingly. But at the end of the day, a lot of people can put their best foot forward, and so I think it really comes out to when they come on board and you're actually taking them out and you're seeing how they engage and you're seeing how they interact with families and patients in beautiful situations and in really hard situations. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think you mentioned this earlier too with the advantage you probably have by building a leadership team with former people who were in that role and former CNAs, they're probably a little bit more aware of the signals that might register that this person might not be as compassionate as we would like. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, great. So next from compassion, what would you consider to be a a really important hard or soft skill? Communication. Communication is an absolute must. When you have to difficult, when you have to have those difficult conversations, or support someone emotionally who may be, you know, at an incredibly fragile time in their life, you have to be able to communicate clearly, mm-hmm. concisely. You have to be able to recognize when you're communicating with someone and understanding by the look in their eyes that they're not picking up on everything that you're saying. You have to be able to pick up on the uh, nonverbal, you know, body language when you're communicating with a family, when you're giving that, when you're educating on how to give a medication, you have to be sure that they're absorbing all of that information exactly as you're providing it. And yeah. if they aren't, you have to be able to pick up on that. So communication, both verbal and nonverbal, I think are, is, is, uh, an incredibly important part of it. That's probably a little bit easier to, to vet out in an interview process, both written and verbally, yes. right in, in, in front of you. But that's so important. Um, as we talked in our prep call, my, my mother-in-law just went through a hospice situation, uh, right. fortunately, before COVID. And, and watching the hospice workers with my wife's family was utterly amazing. And, and I don't think, um, to your point, I don't think we knew what to expect. I thought it would be more transactional. And the person that was uh, helping with my wife handle that situation, to your point, kind of took ownership of the whole situation. And because my right. wife felt compassion from her, she trusted her. Right. And if a, ho- a frontline hospice worker comes in, a caregiver comes in, whether it's nurse or aide or social worker or chaplain, if they come in, our job is to make sure that you get to be the family member, mm-hmm. that you let us do the, the caregiving, you let us do that work so that you can actually be in the moment and be present. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So compassion and communication, uh, what would be, and probably there's probably more, but the, the third of the top three, what would it be? Yeah. Uh, creativity. Ah. So you have got to get uh, to a place where you can get really creative. And sometimes that is, I think about our uh, our team in Hawaii. We have a location in Hawaii that's a really, really large location. And there are some, there are some challenges to living on an island. And so we have to be super creative in how we're uh, making sure that they have their basic essential needs. And so there are, you know, or, or that you are fulfilling the wishes of that patient. Sometimes that means they just want to be able to go outside, but they're bed bound. Mm -hmm. And so how do we do that? If they don't have an appropriate walkway, right? Where you can just roll a a wheelchair out. I got a picture recently from one of our aides in uh, Hawaii where she had gotten this patient. She had somebody helping her and they ended up being able to get this patient out in the front lawn where she has her big garden and she has flowers and you could see this patient just basking in the sun and Mm -hmm. it was so meaningful and it was a little thing it was a little thing but she got creative enough to say how can i do this because this is what this is what she really wants 
And so it's just, you got to get creative. You got to get creative in how you're able to, uh, if you have family members who don't live with the patient and it's maybe just a caregiver or they live alone, how do you make sure that they can have that interaction? Well, today mm -hmm. it's probably easier than ever, right? We just pick up the phone and we do FaceTime. Uh, a FaceTime or we mm -hmm. do some sort of, but that hasn't always been the case. And no. so sometimes we have to get really creative. Yeah, I think that that's rooted in the first traits that you mentioned, which is compassion. If I don't have compassion, I'm not going to even think of being creative. I just, right. I'm going to do the minimum amount of work I have to do. So, uh, you know, speaking of the leadership books that you've read and Tim Ferriss, by the way, would not be an author that a lot of people would throw out there initially. Yeah. Um, let's get into, you have your own, your, your own podcast as well, which is called uh, Evoke Greatness. Right. Um, there's a whole lot in that title that I want to drill yes. into here. Everything you just listed, compassion, communication, creativity, the things you're doing to motivate and build your team, I could drop you into any company, and I'm sure you could rock it, right? Yeah, it just translatable happens. skills, right? All translatable. Your, right. your, your passion is obviously hospice. You've grown up in it. You've, you've been on the front lines. You've seen the impact, both positive and negative. What inspired you to, to start a podcast about evoking greatness and, and drill into the word evoke? Why did you choose that particular word? Yeah. So going back to your first part of the question, which is how did I get to a place where I wanted to do a podcast or at least with that uh, kind of genre, I have been on my journey around mindset, growth, um, expand, you know, just really trying to learn everything I can and become that eternal learner for a handful of years. But uh, let's see, probably 10 years. But prior to that, for my first 30 years, it was a pain point for me. Mm. I was so insecure and I did not feel like I had a sense of worth. Mm. Um, and it was something that I always battled with. I battled with through school as a kid. I battled growing up and I even battled early on in my career. And so that, that had me make some poor decisions in leadership, even mm. as, an, as an early leader and as I was trying to figure that out. And so I really got on this kick where I, I wanted to figure out how do I grow? How do I expand? How do I not just have these blinders and, and this be the only view I have? And so I started reading, I think I started following Lewis Howes and um, School of Greatness and his podcast and then started, you know, reading more books and started exploring that even more. Carol Dweck, her book on mindset, all of that, it was like every book got me excited for the next one. I wanted to consume everything I could. And then I started putting it into practice. And then I started getting myself into better shape because I was focused on the things that were really good for me and making, you know, like habit stacking good decisions and good habits. And so all of that has just been this kind of work that I've been doing over the course of the last 10 years. And I love sharing all of the things that I did wrong. And it hasn't always been that way, right? Sometimes you... Sure. When you have a big ego and you don't want to share all the mistakes you've made and the areas that you could have made better decisions that you didn't, um, when you when you get past that ego piece mm -hmm. and you're more along the lines of trying to serve others by way of sharing that, you know, I've had people who have shared things with me that helped me avoid the mistakes that they made. And so that was a gift to me. And so how mm -hmm. can I, if I had people who helped me along the way, it's my responsibility to make sure that I do the same for others. Mm -hmm. And so I try to do that in my everyday interaction. I try to do that as I lead. I try to do that as a friend and a mom and a wife. Um, but how could I maybe even get a little bit bigger of an impact or reach? And so I sure. had really wanted to do this for probably a year prior to actually um, just saying, that's it, I'm going to do this. And so I finally mm -hmm. decided to do it. And then it was like, then you have to decide a name. And that feels like yeah. a bigger deal than even making the decision to do a podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's and the so creative I had block. To, yep. That's right. So I had to research and figure out a name is really, really important. And so I have pages and pages of potential names that I was going to call the podcast. Um, but greatness had to be in it because that is the, you know, I have a constant... Um, direction to strive in and that never stops so greatness you don't just hit a wall and you stop and then you're great yep. like it is a continual evolution of the of trying to get to a sense of greatness and then evoke is to call something from within right I, I can be great on the outside but if I'm not great on the inside then I'm incongruent there and so it's kind of wow. calling greatness from within that was awesome <laughs> we, ne we never planned that question <laughs> but I was really curious it's a 
That's a really no, we didn't. It's a thoughtful answer. I mean, I, I that I think people will love to Thank hear you. why you named your podcast. And I'm gonna go rename mine tomorrow because it mine sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was not nearly as thoughtful. And I, I kind of wish your podcast was around when I was an early entrepreneur. Because as you mentioned, I created a, a podcast called Eating Crow because I've made a ton of mistakes. And, you know, you're right. I, I, I'd i love to share them, even if it's just with coworkers, friends, but my kids, right? Hey, here's a documentary of everything I've done wrong. Please don't do that. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. Except as kids... You don't hear that message no. the same. And, and so that's the really interesting piece is even with, even with our kids, I have a 10 and 13 year old boys. And you would think that, you know, our house is filled with motivational messages. And I just went and, uh, and got new kind of signs and things to hang up on their walls for them all about champion mindset. Because I think if you, it's almost impossible to have a terrible mindset and, and have your mom force you to be around like sure. motivational stuff all the time. <laughs> But they hear things differently from oh, yeah. different people. And so as I try to even kind of help coach them in a different way than just being a mom, uh, they, you know, I have to learn to say things in different ways so that they absorb it. And, and I think that helps me as a leader as well because I have to recognize the individuality of uh, It's so important for parents to hear that, leaders to hear that, because it applies for everybody you're working with in your own company. Everyone processes information in Correct. and out differently. And your boys... Um, I, one thing I've noticed about parents that we forget, it's the, it's the actions and the subtle behaviors that kids pick up on much more than you think, right? They may not right. understand the motivational, you know, champion mindset signs in the room, but the fact that you did it, they have this un recurring theme in their head that my mom's kind of a, there's no other word for it right now. So forgive me, kind of a badass, Right. <laughs> and by the way, there's something kids want to look, they want to look at their parents as heroes. They want to think that's something right. I want to strive for and, and, and be attainable. I, I struggled as a parent, particularly when my kids were growing up, most television shows and cartoons portray parents the exact opposite. They portray them as stupid, mm -hmm. idiot losers who their kids can just pull the wool over their eyes all the time. That bothered me. That's not how I viewed my parents. I don't want to be viewed that as way with, with my kids either. So that's deliberate and it's, it's great. What, what's different about your two boys? Do they approach, if they both approached a soccer game, would they approach it differently? Uh, sure. Very, very yeah. differently. Um, it's interesting. So my oldest, he's 13 and he is way more like me from an emotional mm -hmm. perspective so he is very empathetic. He feels everyone's pain. But he also knows, okay, I need to get something in my mind. And so it made me think about a time when we were at uh, football practice. And so I'm you know, just sitting there probably doing work while watching them. And, uh, and he had to run one last lap. And I always tell him, last one, best one. Like you mm -hmm. give 110%. Last one, so I say it like 10 times, last one, best one, last one, best one. And so I'm saying it as he's running, yeah, like, come on, you know, it, like last one, best one, buddy. And he comes up after he's done to get water and he's just like about to fall on the ground. He's like, all I kept thinking was last one, best one. And I'm like, yes. That's awesome. So he's, he has to be intentional in his thoughts to get, cause he can, you know, we can all yeah. go south quickly. And he has that tendency too to, uh, if he allows it in his mind and lets it keep going, yeah. you, oh, you yeah. can spin. Um, whereas my 10 year old, holy cow, he doesn't ever think anything is impossible. He just goes. And so he doesn't require as much like mental uh, strengthening. He just, he's like, all right, well, no, no, of course I'm going to win, mom. Yeah. I mean, it's like not even a question. And he's willing to do the work. And so he just, it's, it's really interesting. He excels more academically and my other son excels yeah. more socially. And so it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's the really interesting that, interesting thing is you become a parent and you recognize the personalities and the skills and the, and the traits that they're developing, that they're absorbing from you. And sometimes you're like, Ooh, <laughs> let's work on this a little bit because I don't want you to get that skill from here. I want you to do better than well, I did in that area. That's because you're plugged into your kids' lives. Uh, you're not letting right. a TV or a screen raise your kids, which is just easier. 
right? It's just easier. Um, yeah, I had uh, sure. uh, a, a gentleman in one of my earlier podcasts. His name is Rich Font, and he said the most incredible thing, and it was it was pure natural. He wasn't rehearsed. A great example of parenting. He said I was I was editing some video as a videographer, and I was right in the middle of it, and I noticed that both my kids' rooms doors were closed, and it was quiet. So that's not normal. So I got up and walked, and they were both sitting on an iPad doing something. So I looked at them both and said, let's go play a game. I pulled them away from that. brought them, And I said, Rich, do you have any idea how important that was? There's two things that are important there. Number one, you recognized it. Most parents, they don't want to recognize it. It's, just, it's quiet. It's peaceful. Great. Let me do my thing. So you recognized it. That's really important. But then in the middle of your busy work project, you got off your butt, hit pause, and went and engaged with your kids. Because he can now have a right. he can have a conversation so like important. you did. If I asked most parents to describe their children, they wouldn't be able to give me that level of detail. They just they, yeah, my kids are my kids. Yeah, you know, pain in the ass. But the fact that you can recognize the nuanced differences in the way they approach things is going to provide such a rich relationship for you when they get older as well. And I think the sense of awareness around knowing mm-hmm. it's not black and white. So earlier on, I, I was, I, I wanted them both to be readers because I think when you read or, you know, when you're a reader, you can really expand your mind and you can grow. And what I found was I would force my 13 year old when he was younger, I would force him and he wouldn't enjoy it, mm-hmm. but I would force him to read. Whereas at 5 AM, my 10 year old may wake up and come down and read with me. And so what I found was, okay, I have audible as well. I like to have a, a book in hand and read like that. It's just mm-hmm. part of my morning routine. And, but he totally yeah. likes the audiobook piece. So I said, great, here's the login to my Audible. Whatever book you want that let's just, as we go down and read, I don't care whether you're listening to it uh, you know, from Audible or whether you're at book in hand reading, but take in the knowledge. And so it's learning to be flexible around those things and recognizing when your kid is enjoying it. Because if you're gonna force your kid to do something, they're never going to enjoy it, right? They're almost going to become sure. resentful over it. And so if you can engage them in a way where it actually speaks to them, then all the better. Then they're, then they're really going to get something out. And there's and a, the there's a very subtle, uh, important lesson to what you described there. Just because your kids aren't going to enjoy something or don't like something doesn't mean you shouldn't ask them to do it. Right. Understanding that everybody approaches it differently and finding a way to help it register and let them get something out of it is really important. Again, it's hard. It takes time. It takes thought. Uh, my kids are all the same. My oldest, my daughter, she's the oldest, loved to read, always loved to read. Uh, my oldest son disdained it growing up, right? He was more of a, an, as you described, an audible learner. If he could hear it and visualize it, he could probably retain it. And my youngest one sounds like your right. 10-year-old, right? He just, I mean, I played great today. <laughs> Whether he did or not, he felt like he played great today. And it would be great to live in Sammy's right. head for a while. But that confidence, because my oldest son looks at him like, no, you didn't. <laughs> Were you watching the same game, buddy? I was, I was there. So, but that, that, he's a great reader. He's a good student. He just kind of flows through life with a natural, a natural care. But what we've had to pay attention to is when something's bothering him, it takes us a little while longer to get to it. And if we're not paying attention, that could have, that could be an issue. My oldest son has my wife's emotions 100%. He wears them on his sleeves. You know when it's good. You know when it's bad. My daughter's a little more like me. She's a stone cold killer, right? She just kind of like this all the time. When it gets bad, it's probably you don't probably want to be around. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think what's great about this is that as you build your team out, the people that are listening to this can see how you translate this to your, your team. Every one of the folks in your team has different skill sets, has different learning capabilities and abilities and passions and desires. When you assembled your team, did you consciously assemble people around you that made you better or addressed your weaknesses? Was it thoughtful or did, did, did it just naturally occur that way? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up from that question a little bit and tell you a lesson that oh, I please. learned uh, early on after someone pointed it out to me, and then that'll lead into sure. my answer to, the, to this question. I used to hire people who I thought were great. And, and, and you're going to laugh at why someone finally pointed out to me, they said, do you realize you hire people just like you? And I was like, Oh, well, I thought they were great because they did all the things like I did them. Right. And so it wasn't 
uh, it wasn't growing anyone. We weren't covering the weak points. I was hiring people who had the strengths that I had, not that didn't have the strengths of the weaknesses that I had to you know, help plug the holes. And so I really had to sit on that feedback for a little bit and I thought, well, wait a second. Okay, well, you know, maybe this is right and, and kind of work through that, a unpack it a little bit. And so the team that I have today, holy cow, I'm so grateful. Um, they were people intentionally hired for their skill set. They were dynamic in the way they engaged, and they're all very different, very, very different. But they all have strengths of areas that regionally we need. They have strengths of things mm -hmm. that I may not be great at. And so we're not missing anything, you know? And so we really balance each other out well. And is, as much as I think I'd walk through fire for them, I think, you know, the same goes goes sure. both ways. And if you can lead that way and you have a team that feels that sense of support around one another and empowerment, then they're going to go out and they're going to lead those teams that way. You know, their teams and, and it's going to be a ripple effect. And that's a really, that's a gift. You know, you, one of the hashtags in your profile is the rising tide mentality. Uh, big believer yes. in, in that approach for several reasons. One of the things that I've, um, I've coined the phrase and I'm still trademarking it is personal brand for, if I'm thinking from a marketing department, personal brand is the rising tide that floats a corporate brand, right? If you've got leaders in your company in any department and they're constantly building a brand around their point of view and their particular domain, marketing operations, human resources, it doesn't even have to be the company's point of view. Now you've built a company with really intelligent, thoughtful, provoking people and you simply look at that brand and go, holy cow, that's a group of people I'd like to work with because they're enabled to have their opinions. Right. So when you talk about, and what you just said is the team feels a sense of support from each other and they'll lead their own teams. That's a rising tide, isn't it? And it all ships oh, yeah. benefit from it. It doesn't matter, all ships benefit from it. And so that's why I say, I, if you can have that rising tide mentality where if you are improving those around you, it is only going to serve each other the people above them, below them, around them, and the organization as a whole. And then if that's working as an organization, we're people taking care of people, right? And so those people being cared for at the end of their life, they too get lifted up by oh, that. Oh, that's powerful. People taking care of people. At the end of the day, if, if everybody approaches it with compassion, as you described before, the right communication and creativity, they feel like they're bringing their A game then that does translate to their patients and their family members, without a doubt. Right. When you when you gobble up all the books you've gobbled up behind you in the bookshelf to your right that we can't see yet, what are the three biggest life lessons, or lead, I'll just say leadership lessons, that you've either learned from the books or you've learned in your career that if your two sons were standing in front of you at ages 25 and said, I'm about to take my first leadership role, what would you tell them to think about? The number one thing that I constantly talk about, it, whether it's at home, personally, professionally, at work, other people's opinions are none of your business. It's the most powerful oh. advice that if I could go back to my 18-year-old self or my 10-year-old self or anyone around me, other people's opinions are none of your business. Wow. They do not serve you. They will oftentimes hold you back. And so I lived a lot of years worried about what everybody else thought about me, what they were going to say. Well, I can't speak up with this idea that I have that I feel so passionate about inside because what if they think it's right. stupid? And then, you know, and I think back, gosh, if I would have, if somebody would have just spoken into me or I would have been in a place to hear it, that would be the number one piece of advice for everyone because you have social media that just influences people's lives and it can be positively or negatively. And you have to be really, really careful with that. And if you are focusing your life on living in a way that is to serve people regardless of what people are going to say, mm -hmm. whether it be good or bad, you are truly going to sure. serve people. If you are living in a way where you are worried that you've got to make sure that you have the right this, the right that, that you say the right thing, that you put the right hashtag, yeah. that you have the right frame, that then you are going to live in this bubble that is eventually going to burst. And so that is huge. And I try to make sure that my boys know that it, you, you would think you would only need to worry about it with girls, you know, growing up, but it's not, it is boys too. And so I just tell them other people, it doesn't matter what 
what they think or say, be you. And so I think that's the number one thing. Um, make declarations. Okay. Declare what it is that you want to do. Uh, that too can be hindered by being worried about what other people think. But there have been some ideas that I've had in my mind for, for 10 plus years that now I will spit those out without, without question. Sure. And some of them are really, really big and scary. And, and guess what? Those are some, that's something that you know, I'm going to continue working on to make that declaration really, you know, to realize mm -hmm. that. And so I think, think big and, ha and declare what it is that you're going to do. Oh, that's great. And then I would say, you know, servant leadership, serve others. Every, if, if everything you do, you really seek to serve others by, you will reap the rewards tenfold. And it's not in the way of ego and it's not in the way of vanity and it's not in the way, I mean, it is like you get filled up mm. from the inside out. And if you can lead that way and guide others to lead that way by, you know, by a couple of those philosophical viewpoints, you're going to end up Absolutely. on the right side. You know, the first lesson, the way you worded it was very interesting to me. Other people's opinions are none of your business. I've heard people say, none of pe other people's opinions are not your concern. Don't worry about it. But to use the term none of your business almost makes it a two-way street, right? Right. It's none of your business. So sometimes don't even ask. You don't care. Yeah. Not only you don't worry about it, you shouldn't, it's not just none of your business. It's a very different thought. Yeah. It's, it's none like, of your They can have it, their own that's opinions. Right. It just and like, I'll, and, and I, they shouldn't be worried about your opinion. Right. It's, it's almost creating this two way street. It's excellent. 100%. Excellent. And I have to give credit where credit is due. That's a Rachel <sighs> Hollis quote. And when I first uh, started following Rachel Hollis, that was one of the first things that she talked about was people are so worried. She's a, a motivational leader for a lot of women. And People are so worried, and she too, it was something she struggled with, and I think it's something with, that so many of us struggle with. And again, I found that it's really not just women. You know, I've interviewed a number of men mm -hmm. on my podcast as well that sure. they've struggled with this. I think we all get caught up in that, and it's easy, to, it's easy to do, and it's maybe not so easy to get out of. But once you flip that lens, it really well, changes I, things. Well, I think if you can figure out the first one, the other two will follow naturally. Even when I started posting on LinkedIn, and I'm not saying my LinkedIn content is relevant or valuable, but I had to get through this. Every time I started writing a post, well, what are people going to think about this? And, mm -hmm. you know, when you said declarations, that was almost what I had to get my arms around. People call it imposter system, imposter syndrome, whatever you want to call it. But I realized I've got a point of view. It comes from 40 years of experience of doing this, good and bad more the bad probably than anything else. I've had people tell me that they're motivated by it, so why don't you share more of it? And what I realized, some people will gravitate towards it and like it. Other people just won't care, and very small percentage of people won't like it. And that's okay. Right. And uh, once that's you get right. past that, then it opens up the ability to make some declarations and look back in those things that you've learned that you really feel passionate about, but sometimes didn't feel like you wanted to be the person to put it on the table. Now I'm putting it on the table and hopefully right. it creates ideas, yeah. but yeah. And, and by doing that on a platform like LinkedIn, there are always going to be people sure. judging you in the background, right? Whether they, whether they say it or not. And again, mm -hmm. none of your business. Uh, and there may be people who like it or don't like it, but when you put bold ideas out there, or just the things that are philosophical to you that, that lead you and guide you. And people who don't know you sure. see that. And they say, wow, I'm really aligned with the way that person thinks. And so that's really how I've developed my network are you know incredible people. And I may be connected to one person and I sure. see something that they like. And I'm aligned with them. And then I get exposed to all of their network. And it's really so cool. And I think that's probably how you and I got connected was somebody in our network. And I, I think it, it was, it was Jared, uh, Jared. Oddly Greer, enough, right? I brought your name up to him and he said, oh, yeah, you, you need to have her on your show. So it's funny because I had already gravitated towards your content, but was able to validate, you know, somebody I trust in their opinion felt the same way. Right. Yeah. And so I think uh, mm -hmm. like begets like. And so we can create these really powerful networks uh, through oh, six yeah. degrees of separation around the people that we're connected with. And that's a that's a yeah, powerful I, tool nowadays. LinkedIn to me is uh, I, I'm on it a lot only because it's, it's part of what I do for a living. But I find so much, as you just described, valuable content that's out there for free. If you look in the right places, there are people sharing right. really good information. 
yesterday was a, a pleasant surprise for me. I was asked to be in a podcast, and the reason I was asked is this this person said, I only, I'm very choosy, and I, and I back check and validate what these people are bringing to the table, and he said, your stuff's good. <laughs> I was like, I looked at my wife, and I'm like, mm-hmm. yay. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> cared. It, it, as much as I say I don't care, a little bit of validation that at least what you're doing people are resonating with, it, it just helps tune For your sure. content, right? Are people resonating with this? Good. I should I should explore that more. They're not with this. Why? Felt flat. Okay. Resonate more over here. So it's it doesn't mean it's not right. right. It just means you got to tune it once in a while. That's exactly right. All right. right. So uh, uh, incredible. I, I, I try to take notes without being too distractive. This, these are the most notes I've ever taken in a podcast. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you one final question that I want to leave with our viewers. If there is one leader you could have on your podcast that you haven't yet, a, a, a stretch goal, who would it be? Uh, Ed Milet. Hands down. I know that okay. answer without even thinking about it. Why is that? Uh, he is a Phenom- and again, right? So we, we see these people in social media. I, I don't hang out with Ed Milet, you know, on <laughs> Sundays. Um, but he is, he's incredible. I've been following him for years and his message has stayed congruent, right? Some people mm-hmm. go with what's shiny and, and they, you know, kind of change their uh, philosophies. They change their viewpoint on things based on what's Mm -hmm. happening in the world, what's happening in social media, what's happening that's really popular, whether that's to follow something or to denounce something. I think we've probably all seen that over the course of the last couple of years. And there's people that, you know, these famous people that we follow and sometimes we're disappointed by the things that they're doing. And, and he has really stayed true to what he does. And so I think the part that I appreciated about him is, uh, he doesn't wax and wane on his faith. And that's something that's important to me. And it doesn't matter that he's a Christian and I'm a Christian. It doesn't matter. He's really stayed mm-hmm. focused on doing things the right way. And again, that servant mentality. And it's not about what's going to make me popular or what's the trending thing to do right now. But, but I'll tell you, the time uh, I had heard him very first talk about, I forget who he was even interviewing, but he's got some of the most incredible um, interviewees of all wow. the podcasts in all the world. And he's probably one of the top five, but he, he said something that really resonated with me as a person and as a Christian. And that was, I'm going to live my life. Like when I get to heaven, God is going to hold up a mirror. And if I have lived my life the way he sees fit, where I get there and he says, well done, my good and faithful son, then what I see in that mirror mm-hmm. will actually be my reflection. But my worst fear is, is I will get there and he will hold up a mirror and I will have no idea who that person is mm-hmm. that he actually created me to be. I still get goosebumps just saying it out loud. But it, it was so profound. And he just does, I think he's an incredible human. You know, not just his fame and his books and his podcasts and, and the things that he does, but I think he's a really good well, human. Well, that's, that's awesome. I didn't expect that answer, but that's great. It's, it's, it, I mean, it's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is I know you're a very faith-driven person. Um, I did my first, what I'll call truly faith-based podcast episode on The Line Within with Chris Granger. I don't know if you've seen any of his stuff. He's fantastic. Um, and his podcast is growing because he's, he's reaching people with a really great message. Um, he, he probably mm-hmm. pried more out of me than anyone has in a long time, <laughs> but it's all out there now. You can hear it. <laughs> so if you, if you, you want to find out go. what makes me tick, but I, you have to be true to your message. You have to be true to your faith and recognize that some people just, and by the way, there are people that won't align with it, that respect it, right? If you deliver it in, in a thoughtful way. And there are people that will just, you know, trigger off an emotional reaction and they got to remember that their opinion is none of my business. Right, right, absolutely. And exploring different views, right? It doesn't mean that that, uh, changes your view. It doesn't mean it doesn't change your view, but being open to exploring alternate views of, you know, if we all looked at things with the same set of lenses, this world would be really, really boring, right? We'd be a bunch of minions. But I think the beauty of the world we live in today is the fact that we all get the lens that we have that's shaped by the experiences in our life. And that's how we end, you know, that's our way of being. It is completely. And it, and at the end of the day, most people, I'll, I'll use the term most are trying to do the right thing. 
how they were raised, whatever their faith is, um, the, the environment they've been in since they, you know, became an adult, all those things contribute to their opinions. But at the end of the day, most people don't wake up and try to be intentionally harmful. The people that do get right. a lot of press, and apparently it, 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 it taints our views of society, but most people I encounter are trying to do the right thing. And that's to your point. I enjoy those conversations about, hey, one of, one of my closest friends is, is Jewish. His wife is, is you know, Catholic. And we have some amazing discussions about what, what his faith means. And they're really powerful and, and they're thoughtful and we challenge each other. Right. And but at the end of the day, we smile. And one of us picks up lunch. The next time the other one does, and just, we just continue the conversation. So I think it's fantastic to, to take right. that approach. Sonny, thanks so much for, uh, I think, just a rewarding episode of really poignant tips on leadership and, and compassion and weaving that into what you do at Bristol, which I think is just an incredible mission, and we wish you nothing but the best. Thanks for checking out Eating Crow. Like and subscribe so you never miss a video.